Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood. You're watching The Political Vigilante. That's what we're doing, guys. We're making Gotham great again. Oh, I love this graphic when it pops up. What do you guys think about making this into a t-shirt and selling that? Currently, I have this making Gotham great. Very simplistic. You can get this um, on my website. Go to GrahamElwood.com. Also, there's a Patreon tier. If you subscribe, you get a t-shirt. Cool way to support the show. And you are telling people you're making Gotham great again. Another great way to support the show is the $5 topic tier. So for $5, you can suggest a topic, uh, send me an article link, and that's what this one is. It was submitted by Tim Stack, who's been a supporter of the show from the very beginning. Ending Economic Conscription by Megan Day. The link to this full article is in the show notes. Um, it's, a very, it's a very intriguing article, and it kind of goes into a video I did several months ago about the military is having a hard time recruiting people and I said get ready or recession's coming. So because we've talked about that we don't have a draft here we've had a poverty draft we've had an economic draft and what this uh, author Megan Day is talking about is how we can not play the military industrial complex's game um, to not make it so people only have one option, which is to join the military, you know? Because the military is, I mean, it's a pretty good deal, man. Health benefits, pension. I mean, if you stay in long enough, you, you know, I know people are like, got to stay in for 20 years because then they're set. And what a not, it's not a bad deal. You join up and you're 18, 19, 20 years old. By the time you're in your 40s, you're, you're done. You got a pension, you're, you're, you know, you're making benefits and it's all great. So... The question that is asked, how can we take on the American military machine by starving it out of recruits and building up the civilian welfare state? Giving people more options, more opportunity, federal jobs guarantee, universal basic income, stuff like that that we've talked about on this show could really make it so... Pe I mean, I, I, I've, told, I've said this story before, but when I, you know, was... I went to Afghanistan to do comedy tours in 04 and 06 and 07, and then I went to Iraq 07, 08, and 2011. And in 20, 2008 and 2011, it was vi I, the number of people who said, oh, I re-enlisted because I needed the money. They gave me a ten, twenty thousand dollars re-enlistment bonus. That's a sizable chunk of change um, to come back over here and be deployed. And I already have combat experience, so I, that's why I did it. Um, there's no jobs back home. You know, there's no jobs back home. So... Here, let me give you some statistics that are in this article. The United States has 800 foreign military bases. The rest of the world combined has only 70. 800 foreign military bases. We're not imperialistic? We're not an empire? Okay. Hmm. Our nation's leaders are the makers and breakers of combat, our presidents and generals, the gods of war. Oh, she's a good writer. <laughs> No doubt, strong moral and ideological opposition to war and militarism are at the heart of any effective strategy. It's why we need a peace and freedom party. It's why I'm glad the Women's March is, is calling itself a peace, you know, an anti-war march. We need an anti-war movement back in this country again. We really need it. Um, but we should also consider the tactical importance of ambitious social democratic reforms like a federal jobs guarantee, strong unions, and the universal social provision of higher education and health care. That's the other thing. And we talked about this before. If the Democratic Party was going into these midterm elections saying across the board, all of our candidates are for $15 an hour minimum wage, Medicare for all, free college tuition, who would they lose to? Who would they lose to? What could the Republicans come back and say? What, what, what argument would they say? I mean, if you had the choice of like free college tuition and your health care was already paid for, would you need to go join the military and go fight corporate oil wars for so billionaires can line their pockets? Would you do that? Would you really do that? The reforms may not put an end to the American empire, but they do have an important effect. They make it harder for the military to recruit from the domestic working class. To combat the reign of the American military abroad, we need to end economic conscription at home. This is the thing, what this article is, is saying, 
in a very eloquent and very intelligent way is the thing we've been talking about on this show. I know, you know how I always say everything's connected? How everything is connected? Right? And the ills of, a, you know, kleptocracy and oligarchs running everything, they, everything's connected to their greed. And the solutions are all connected. And the solutions help and fix everything. You see this? We talk about unions and free college tuition and Medicare for all. That would then have this amazing effect of people not needing to join the military because there's no options. You know, we would have more money for the economy. People would actually have money to buy anything. I just watched a video by, by Richard Wolf, who's been on Jimmy Dore before. I'm sure many of you know him. If you don't, please search him on YouTube and watch anything. He is a, what he calls himself, a Marxist economist or Marxian economist. And um, he talks about all this stuff. He talks about how, um, you know, China has overtaken us economically and the corporate media isn't talking about that. The median income in China in 2008 was $2,000. That was the median income of Chinese labor. Now, 10 years later, it's $8,000. So it is quadrupled in 10 years while our wages have, have been stagnant. The ruling class, the one percenters, they've, they're, oh my God, they're record profits. So this is one of the things that if everybody had good, we would need this. Would there be all of this racism and tension? Would there be all of this red state, blue state rhetoric? Would people need to join a gang or the Klan or a militia or <laughs> sell drugs or anything like that if they had all of these options? I doubt it. Those numbers would all go down. When d domestic economic prospects are grim, the military is no problem recruiting soldiers. When those prospects improve, recruitment fails. How do we know? We can see a micro version of this process happening right now. This year, the first time in 13 years, the Army has reported it is short thousands of recruits. This year's unemployment rate is also the lowest we've seen in the same time period. The facts are related and the military agrees. Now, I, I'm not trying to p pick an argument with this person. Obviously, we've talked about this before, the unemployment rate they kind of cook the books and stuff like that. The, the unemployment numbers, if you work one hour a week, you're considered employed. A lot of people, um, you know, 60% of the population has doesn't even have $1,000 in savings. But this isn't, the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to poke holes in this argument. It's accurate because everybody's working. <laughs> it's just not great jobs. You know, everyone's driving Uber and Lyft and working a $10 an hour job and working two and three jobs to pay the bills. Don't, we've talked about people donating plasma to pay their bills on the show, but this is, this is true. The unemployment numbers are down and the, the military is short recruits, you know. Um, the more recruits the military has, the more deeply it embeds itself in working class American life. Boy, this is a great point. This obviously presents an enormous obstacle to building opposition to war. And it, it is precisely the working class that must oppose war because not only are workers the majority of society and the group that with the actual leverage to force change, but they're also the ones who fight and die in the wars themselves. Oh yeah. The working class are the ones that went to war after 9-11. Kids that knew they were, I mean, yeah, some people of all socioeconomic groups after 9-11 said, oh, I'm going to join up and, and go fight terrorism. I understand that. A very good friend of mine who lost three friends in the Trade Towers, he's from New York, and he was in the recruiter's office September 12th, and he was in his 30s. Um, and he went over there for very noble reasons. And, um, but then there's like... The people I know that, that went to high school in working class parts of the country after 9-11, everyone from their graduating class went to, like not everyone, but a lot of people joined the military when they graduated after 9-11. People that I know that went to private schools and stuff like that around that time, mm. not that many joined the military, you know? And that's just it. And if you're not a lot of jobs, there's like, you know, a factory that's going out of business or <laughs> working in the fields and then the military shows up with all their health benefits and their shiny uniforms, what are you going to do? Because the military learned this in the 70s when there was a draft 
two things happened that they learned from in Vietnam. First of all, the war was on the news every night. You'd come home, everyone would be watching their dinner. They'd be watching GIs dying, they'd be watching Vietnamese civilians dying, and all this bloodshed and terror and mayhem was coming into Americans' homes every night over dinner. Right? Because that's when you watch the news. You watch the seven, 6 o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news. That's what everyone sat around and watched the news. There were three channels. There was no internet, there was no cable. There was three channels, and you watched it. And you watch Walter Cronkite tell you about the battle that just happened today outside of Quezon or whatever. And there was a draft. So when people were seeing how awful this war was, people were getting drafted and people were saying, I'm not going to fight this war. So there's been no draft since. And we saw in the first Gulf War in what was that, 90 or 91, no, we didn't see that on TV. We saw embedded reporters that were basically mouthpieces for the machine. And that's what happened this last one too. Um, so that's how they're doing it. And that's why now this article brings up amazing points. Um, a combination of a jobs guarantee, strong unions, and universal social programs would put an enormous dent in the Army's program of economic conscription. There would still be an ideological battle to fight over the American uh, nationalism and militarism, but it would be easier to win if the military was less embedded in America's working class life, and it won't be less embedded until working people stop gravitating towards the military out of economic self-interest. Social democratic reforms, therefore, must be considered part of any serious anti-war or anti-imperialist strategy. I cannot agree with this more. This is the thing that, um, why I bring this up constantly, and I will, I will not stop bringing this up, the fact that 22 vets a day commit suicide. How many of those vets joined up, joined the military for economic reasons? Or even noble reasons, like you know, Mike, meeting Mike Preisner, doing the, the the Jimmy Dore show, and hearing his story, and you know, he joined up in the military, uh, joined a patriot, and then went over to Iraq and saw this isn't right, what we're doing, and came back an anti-war activist. Um, I've met people in Veterans for Peace, you know, out there doing the progressive comedy tour, and, and to hear their stories. I've just talked to vets. I've talked to a lot of vets. So. It's something that um, this is a great strategy. This is a really good article. And again, I thank Tim Stack for sending me this because this just, I, I love this show. I love getting other points of view and looking at a situation with a new solution. I wasn't, you know, I, I've talked about this before, but the, this is so succinct the way this article is written about the solutions for this. So I'll end this episode on something from Eugene Debs the socialist presidential candidate from 1920 that was put in prison. We're learning more about Eugene Debs, aren't we? The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose. While the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives, in order for our society to achieve peace, working people must realize they're being conned into war. Thanks for watching, you guys, The Political Vigilante. Please support the show on the Patreon. There's Bitcoin wallets. Those links are below. Like and subscribe. Download it on iTunes. Those are great free ways to support the show. There's also a P.O. box if you want to send cash or a money order or whatever if you don't want to be tracked. Um, so it's so cool. And, you know, I, I appreciate getting all of your responses from everybody all over the world. Shout outs to people, you know, Japan and everywhere else. I really appreciate it. It's great hearing from all of you. Thanks for watching.